Hello, welcome to this UCL lunch hour lecture on novel ways to treat the brain with gene therapy. I'm Stephanie Shorge. I am Professor of Physiology and the Interim Dean of Life Sciences here at UCL, and I'm chairing today's lecture. I'm going to introduce you now to Dr. Gabrielle Lignani, who's today's lecturer and a close collaborator and friend. So Gabrielle Lignani is an associate professor at UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology, and he is in the Department of Clinical and Experimental Epilepsy. Gabrielle got his PhD in 2012 in Italy in the University of Genoa, and he did his first postdoc at the Italian Institute of Technology. Shortly after that, he moved to UCL, where he joined me and several other groups in the uh, Department of Clinical and Experimental Epilepsy for a postdoc. And the moment he hit the ground, he was running and very quickly went on to win an independent Marie Curie individual fellowship that was based on developing new CRISPR editing tools to treat epilepsy in the days before everybody knew how to use CRISPR. Gabrielle has continued to break ground and he continues to lead an exciting research platform developing new and novel approaches such as the one he's going to be talking about today. So before we begin, uh, I want to let you know that there will be time at the end of the lecture, about a quarter to the end of the hour, uh, and there will be questions that you can submit, and those should be submitted on Slido. If you enter the Slido um, email address, which you should have, and and the um, into your internet browser, and then enter the event code, which is hash gene therapy, uh, you should be able to type in questions, and we'll at, we'll um, answer them at the end. So very exciting to have Gabrielle's update on his latest work. And I'm going to hand over to Gabrielle now for his talk. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks for, uh, for also the invitation to give these uh, lectures. So today I, I will speak about uh, uh, one of the latest uh, approach that we developed in the lab. And just to let you know that my lab is quite a young lab, like five years old. and. Uh, we are focusing on three main domains. One is, is to study neurodevelopmental diseases, both in rodents models, but also in human models, and then develop treatment for those diseases, understanding the pathology first. Then we study also mechanism of uh, called uh, homeostatic plasticity, that are the mechanisms that uh, maintains, for example, the brain uh, at a physiological level. And, and then the last one that is mostly what I will speak about today is to develop a gene, gene therapy and um, for uh, neurological diseases, mostly focus on uh, uh, epilepsy, intractable epilepsies. So I will speak quite a lot about epilepsy. So I thought that to give a general information of a general information about what is epilepsy, um, and just to let you know that this kind of approach can work also for other neurological diseases. This is just uh, an example of how we can use these uh, technologies. So epilepsy is is a, a disorder, obviously, of the brain, and it is characterized by having seizures. So all patients with epilepsy have seizures. And the seizures uh, is a transient occurrence of uh, symptoms that is caused by abnormal activity in the brain. And the here, down here, and put the pointer, down here you can see that I represent in, in a simplified example in which uh, you see that uh, there is um, a big effect of excitation and less of inhibition that are the two forces that govern the, 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 the brain. So basically when you have an epileptic seizures, you have too much excitation and less inhibition. And so you have a disimbalance in the brain. And uh, I put this cartoon to show that there are different classification of epilepsies, all dependence on, also of kind of seizure that they have and also different comorbidities. And I want to point out the one here on the right, the, one of the most important parts of the talk as well, the etiology of epilepsy. So as you see, there are many different etiology, and a lot of them are, are still unknown. But just to give you an idea, an idea that the, the, the concept that no matter what is the cause, it can be genetic, uh, uh, metabolic disorders, or immune response, at the end of the day, all the patients have as seizures. All the patients have seizures. 
So this is the common symptoms of, of all uh, of all the epilepsies, no matter what is the cause. So more or less 70-75% is estimated that are, uh, are caused by genetic mutations, so mutation in, in, in the gene in, uh, that, um, that are in, in, in the neurons. And uh, of these 70-75% actually is known uh, almost the 30%, so not a big amount. And these are the names of all the genes found that when they were not working properly, they, had, they cause epilepsy. There are several ones. But it's still quite a, a small number compared to the overall numbers of patients. And uh, I think that you, you are aware what is gene therapy. And I think uh, that is the correct thing. I will explain in the next slides, but just to let you know, if you have uh, genetic mutations that cause a pathology like epilepsy, with a gene therapy, you can correct that mutation. So you can target the cause of the epilepsy. So gene therapy is an experimental technique and it is, is the aim of this technique is to treat disease by modified the, the genetic materials of the patients, so on the cells. And you can do that, for example, if you have a genes that is not working properly, reintroducing a, a new healthy genes and treat the disease or even replace that gene, take it out and put back a, an healthy copy of the same gene. Or in the other way, if the, the gene is causing a, a pathology and is, to, is working too, too, at a high level compared to normal levels, you can also decrease the activity of that gene. And gene therapy can be divided into two big areas, ex vivo, so modified in vitro cells, and then uh, retransplant back to patients or in vivo using uh, different delivery methods. The most used one that is also the one that I will speak about uh, is using uh, adeno-associated viruses that are not harmful viruses that can be used to deliver these genetic materials inside the cells and modify their properties. So to give you an idea of, uh, of uh, why it's uh, important to study treatment for epilepsy, this is the, uh, an overall idea of the clinical needs. So 1% of the population has epilepsy, so quite a lot, a lot of people in the world, like around 50 million. And one third of these patients have no effective drug treatment. So there are no drugs can work to stop their seizures. And usually these patients have the so-called so focal epilepsy, meaning that they're all the seizures that I was explaining before, all that unbalance between the excitation and inhibition of the brain coming from the precise region of the brain, a very defined region of the brain, not from all the brain, but just a precise region. And here I put also some data to show that it's not just a clinical need, but it's also a financial and, and, uh, and society burden. And for these patients that have a focal epilepsy, and uh, that have no drug treatment, uh, that is mostly 70% of, of the patients of that one third with no effective treatment. So we are speaking almost of millions, millions of people worldwide. The only option for them that is not always feasible is the brain surgery. So removing that part of the brain where the seizures start. So to give you some numbers, uh, every year in the UK, 10,000 people develop a refractory epilepsy, so that epilepsy that I was saying, that is not treat, treatable with the drugs. And uh, of these patients, only 2,000 are evaluated for surgery because it's a fault that they can have surgery. But at the end, only 500 are suitable for surgery. So there are at, at least 1,500 people that have no treatment at all, no drugs that works, and no options for surgery. And uh, this is the, the reason why is because you can imagine that uh, uh, resecting a part of the brain uh, is quite invasive, invasive uh, procedures and uh, depends where this region is, where the, the seizures start. Sometimes you cannot remove that part of the brain. For example, if our very close to the so-called eloquent regions, the, re the regions that may make us humans, 
like I don't know the language regions or the, or, or the, the, the motion regions. So you cannot really take out that part of the brain. So these are again other numbers to show, as I said before, 50 million people worldwide have epilepsy. And uh, I want to show so here all that is not just seizures anyway for patients. So you have uh, also other complications and also a, a high increase of depression and anxiety. So as I said before, is is a, a quite huge economic, social, and emotional burden. I as I say before, the idea of of gene therapy, so replacing the mutation and 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 correcting the the problems in the brain that, that the one that cause epilepsy can be done with a very small percentage of, of patients because most of the time we don't know the cause and most of the time it's not the gen other times it's not genetics there is another problem that i want to point it out with epilepsy and uh, almost all the brain disorders that uh, the brain is developed during the years and when you have a, a, a mutation, in this case, is a channel mutation, and it's not important what, what is causing, but you have a mutation to all your life, and the brain is organizing in a way that, uh, that is not uh, as it should be. So if you intervene too late, for example, when uh, an adult patient, probably will not be enough to restore a proper brain, also if you treat the cause. So basically, this is to show the, the dilemma that there is in the field that what we focus on, on treating the cause when we know the cause, or we can just go and treat the symptoms. Because as I say before, all the patients with epilepsy have seizures. So why we don't focus directly on treating the seizures, that is the major, one of the major problems for the, the patients, not the only one, but it's one of the major ones, and, uh, and so we don't need at that point to really know the cause and we can treat all the patients no matter what is the theology. So they've been developing different uh, treatments so far, both treating the cause, but also the symptoms, uh, as I said, the seizures. And today we speak mostly about the gene therapy to treat the symptoms. Why, how this will work, basically, uh, this is, is a cartoon showing a, a human brain with an epileptic focus where the seizures start. So all the seizures in these patients start from this part of the brain. So the, the option, as I say, for these patients that are drug resistant is to take that part of the brain out. But another option can be the gene therapy. So injecting a non-harmful virus there and modify the genome and the gene in those neurons in that particular region of the brain. And uh, how we can do that, basically, how it's possible that what, what, what we will change and what we, why we want to do that. So as I said before, one of the most used uh, delivery methods to deliver these gene therapy approaches to the brain is to use adenosociated viruses that are virus not harmful for humans. They are not dividing, so they stay in the cells when they enter in the cells, and they are not causing uh, immunological response. So the, the virus will carry this gene therapy tool, and the gene therapy tool usually is formed by two components. One component that is called promoter, and one component that is the transgene. These are very important to understand all the following slides. So, the promoter is what drives the transgene. So the promoter is giving the specificity, specificity, the power and the time, meaning that the specificity, because the promoter can be activated in specific cells, can basically be activated by different stimuli, has the power because can decide how much transgene is produced, and time can decide when. The transgene, that is the most important part, is giving the effect. So the promoter is, is, is uh, activating this transgene, and this transgene changes the, the, um, the genome of the, of the cells that is, is uh, where is expressed. So the transgene is the fundamental to do the action and modify something in the cells. The promoter decides when and where is, is, is expressed. So as I said before, uh, there are many causes 
that uh, are on the basis of epilepsies, but uh, and focal epilepsy. We speak mostly about focal epilepsy now, but the the overall uh, um, the overall uh, symptoms is still seizures and this uh, unbalance between the excitation and inhibition in the brain. So in that part of the brain, you have too much excitation. The neurons communicate too much between each other, and so the idea is to target this imbalance. So target, for example, the excitation and decrease their activity. So basically you can restore a proper piece of brain uh, in, in that uh, particular region. So has been developed different, uh, many different approaches so far to trying to tackle this issue and try to target the excitation and decrease the excitation or increase the inhibition. In this case, I will focus mostly on decreasing the excitation. And both in my labs, in Stephanie labs, and um, as well as other collaborators all, all, all over the world, they've been developed several systems in which uh, basically uh, expressing different, uh, dif different uh, components, you are able to decrease the excitability of the neurons, also using, uh, for example, optogenetics. So control is with the light and decrease the activity when the light is on. And, um, and a different others. But uh, <clears throat> all these approaches so far, until recently, have been developed with uh, an idea of a view of gene therapy that uh, is probably oversimplified compared of how really the brain works. Basically, the current gene therapy view that maybe is now is changing a bit is that uh, we have a normal brain, normal we are speaking, when I speak about brain, in this case, I, I speak about the, the focus, the, 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 the epileptic focus. There's normal cells there. And when you have epilepsy, you have more excitability. As I say, you have this increase of excitation. And then you use a gene therapy that uh, in, in this case is constitutive, meaning that is expressed in all these neurons. And you decrease the excitability, the, the, the overall activity of all these neurons, and then you go back to a normal brain. This is the overall idea that uh, that uh, is has been uh, uh, been fought in the field for quite a long time to develop this therapy, right? But is the thing the thing is that the brain and also the pathology as epilepsy is more complicated than that. So just to uh, give you an idea, if you don't remember from uh, from school, uh, and I had to look around, uh, look again to remember, uh, remind me of myself is that in the brain there are many neurons, are 100 billions of neurons that are doing all different things. They are, are not all the same, are all different. And they, if you, just to let you know, to figure out how is this number, because it's quite big, 100 billions of neurons in the brain. If you think a neuron is as a person and you put a person after another in line and you put 100 billion person one after the, uh, the other, you will have, you can cover 14 times the, the, the all the hair. Hair. So it's quite a big number, so if you think about that. And this is all, all in one, I mean, one single brain. And then the, there is also, this is just to show the complexity that can be in the brain, but there is also the complexity of the pathology. And uh, for example, for epilepsy, these are uh, recordings multi electrode recordings in uh, in multi units so different recordings in the brain of patients each line is is a neuron and is during time and uh, when they become black more uh, uh, more black means that they are there is more activity and white is when there is less activity so this is a, a seizures recorded in the patients during time the seizures start here in the red and that you can see that some neurons increase the activity and some also decrease or doing nothing. And this is a seizures and then a consecutive seizures in the same patient show similar pattern. And this means not just that not uh, all the neurons do different things, because as clear here, not all the neurons participate in the seizures, but also that between one seizures and another, uh, there are similar similar pathway of activation of the same neurons that are always participating in the seizures. And this will depend also, will be also dependent on the patients. So what I'm trying to say that uh, is uh, the reality 
of the, the complexity of the brain and complexity of the pathology, the dynamics also of the pathology, is that the, if you have a normal brain where you have some uh, cells that are more active, some less just for, for normal function, in an epileptic brain, sometimes you have an increase of activity of some cells, not all the cells. So if you use a, a, a gene therapy that is, is targeting all the cells and decreases their activity, you will uh, treat also those neurons that are not really important for the pathology. The ideal gene therapy is only to treat the neurons that are involved in decisions and basically go back to a normal physiological brain and not just decreasing uh, all the neurons at the same time. So I wanted to give an example, trying to, to, to explain it better, probably. I don't know, maybe it's more, even uh, I make it more complicated. But if you think a brain like London and you're trying to compare them, so the human brain has many neurons, many connections, as London has many houses and many streets, okay? And uh, epilepsy is divided into different regions, and some regions are more prone to epilepsy. For example, this region here called temporal lobe, that is important, for example, for memory and emotions, and uh, as well as London's main council. So in the uh, example of the seizures, when the seizures start, that start, for example, uh, in, in this area that we, we say before, in the temporal lobe area, is like a fire start in healing. Sorry for people from healing, it's just an example, I took the council randomly. And um, so it's like, a fire start in a house and they can spread fast into a whole house and you have all healing on fire. So the idea of the, the common gene, the, the normal gene therapy that I was explaining before, that com, the, the current view is that you can inject something in that region and stop the seizures to happen there. But uh, actually is, is uh, to do the... the, the the, the comparison with the, with the fire and healing is like having all the time someone watering healing all the time to prevent it to what happens. It's the same that injecting a virus and trying to dump down all the activity of the brain. But what we really need is having automatic sprinkles in all healing house. So when a fire starts in a house, it will be immediately stopped there and not propagate. So, but it will not be on all the time. So it's the idea of this new way to think of the, the gene therapy in, in which only the neurons that get on fire, that, that start the seizures, are the ones that are treated. And so you are treated only the unhealthy neurons and you spare all the other ones that are not part of the pathology. So we... Um, so we, we, we thought a lot of how to do that and how we can actually try to, to, to develop this kind of, of systems. So the first question that we asked is uh, which of these neurons we need to target because how we know which neurons are the ones that participate in the seizures. So basically the basic question is how we distinguish between healthy and unhealthy neurons. And the second one, as I said before, the, the epilepsy, the brain, is a dynamic is, the, uh, is a, a dynamic system in which things change all the time. And if you think about epilepsy and seizures, you realize that uh, patients with seizures actually have seizures probably less than 1% of the time of their day or less than in a month even, because the majority of the time they don't have seizures. So there is something that changed in the brain that caused the seizures. And uh, there are so many processes going on in the brain, also for me now speaking, that uh, is a dynamic process that changes all the time. So how a therapy can follow also those? How can follow the dynamics? Because the therapy needs to know when these neurons have to be treated. So we need a therapy that can know which neurons to treat and when. So something that can distinguish space and time and decide when to treat it. So the idea that we had in mind was to targeting uh, uh, only the hyperexcitable neurons. So those neurons that got in fire, the one that become more active, really when, when they need to be treated. So when they start to be active. And basically the idea is this one on the right. 
is you have neurons with, uh, with different activity, then you have a pathological increase of the activity, and then you have something that restores the normal activity. This something I explained before is a gene therapy tool in which you have a promoter and a transgene therapeutic gene in which the promoter can feel the activity and the transgene can decrease the activity. So you have this kind of close genetic loop, a close loop in which in a normal condition, this promoter is not doing anything because it's sensing only when you have too much activity. And so the transgene, the therapeutic gene is not expressed. And then when the patholo uh, pathological activity increase, this, this, this system is activated. So the promoter activated the therapeutic gene and the gene will decrease the activity and go back to physiological activity. So why is this novel and why it can be a, a good uh, transformative things for, for people with epilepsy, but other, also other neurological disease? Because it's a therapy that can detect the activity levels of the neurons and neuronal sequence by its own, can be turned on automatically and basically decrease the activity and, and prevent the, 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 the seizures to happen. And his, his most important point is the tool that decides which neurons and when to treat. So basically, you not need to decide a priori which kind of neurons you want to treat and when. You just put your gene therapy there, and the gene therapy by its own will decide when the neurons needs to be treated, so when the activity is too high, and and when, so when and where, which neurons, so which neurons is uh, the, 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 in which neurons the activity increase, and when 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 this uh, activity increase. And uh, it's also important that because of that you can target only the epileptic focus, as I say, and uh, all the other regional surveys are spared, and also all the neurons that are healthier, not participating in seizures, are also spared. So basically, going back to the, 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 the cartoon of the gene therapy tool, we will have a promoter that is specific for that can feel the activity. So it's a sensor of the activity. So it can sense the increase of, of, of this pathological activity and it can assign in which time. And you have your transition that have the effect to decrease the activity. So it's a closed loop. And basically, the, the, this is a promoter that can sense the change of, of the, the, the can sense the pathology. And in principle, that this principle, this principle can be used to many other diseases. So any disease that you can think about, neurological disease, but also not neurological, if you know what what change in the pathology, and use that to drive a therapeutic tool to rescue that that change you can create this this closed loop tool for any any pathology so i i, I wanted to put some data just to show you some uh, how to have an idea of uh, what we have done i will explain it and it's not uh, i i didn't put too much details on what which promoter we use which engine we used I can say it now, so you you, you understand why when I write something, what what, what it does means. As promoter, as I say, we, we use the, a sensor of activity that uh, is a promoter of a gene uh, of a family of gene that is called immediate early genes that are genes that can respond to activity, and this gene is called uh, CFOS. And so we use the promoter of this uh, CFOS gene. And the transgene that we used is something that also Stephanie here has developed quite a few years ago, is a potassium channel gene called KV1.1, that in this case we call EKC, that is engineered potassium channel because Stephanie also engineered that to make it working even better. Is a potassium channel, and potassium channel is very important to decrease the If it's, their level increase, they can decrease the excitability of the cells. So as I say, you have this promoter CFOS that sends the activity and this potassium channel that decreases the activity. So first of all, we tested also if you inject this, uh, this, this system in the brain of, of a rodents, if that will change the, the normal physiology, normal behavior of, of these animals, because we want to be sure that we were not affecting any normal functions. And we did a, a test with the open field, so putting the mouse in an open, uh, an open arena, going around, and uh, 
and calculate uh, how much anxiety they have to go in the center that is more open compared to the borders. And we didn't see any difference between uh, before and after the virus, both in controls. This is a control virus and this is our therapy. And we didn't see any difference both in the anxiety, but also how much the mouse was traveling in, in, uh, in this arena. Then we used uh, also a test to, to check for, uh, for um, memory that is called the spontaneous alternation teammates in which the mouse have, uh, have, um, is in a teammates uh, like that, doing like that. And then it's decided if we want to go to right or left and when decide one side, we stay there, it's closed there for 30 seconds. And then you put back the mouse from the start and he needs to decide to go to the other one, to explore the new one. So if you go on the right, in this case, will be correct. If you go on the left, uh, means that he didn't remember that he went in that, uh, in that, game, in that, uh, in that uh, side. So, and then this is a score to score that. Uh, and the 0 0.5 is when it's random, uh, choose between one another and more means that it, they always, almost always choose the right, the right side. And that is the uh, alternation compared to the first one. And there was, uh, again, no difference before and after. And then we did the final experiment where, because we uh, has been known that the CFOS was involved in this kind of behavior, this called contextual field conditioning, that basically is a test in which uh, you put the animals uh, in, a, in a chamber with a very, very light, Put shock that is just for, for them is a sudden things that happens and they are a bit scared about that. And then 24 hours later, you put back the mouse in the same chamber and the mouse freeze because he remember the fear of the day before about the, and he remember the, the foot shock. So he's scared that it can happen again. But if you put the mouse in a new chamber, just changing the, the color of the, of the walls, he will freeze less because um, he'll, uh, he'll, he thinks, okay, it's a new chamber, so why should that happen again at the foot shock? And uh, and so we did some tests and we show basically that with this, uh, with our treatment, if you can see, we didn't see any difference compared to the control viruses, so they freeze a lot in the same, in the, in the same, in the same way. And then we did an experiment to actually show that we can decrease chronic seizures because what we want to do, right? We want the idea is then to, to inject this, uh, this therapy in a focal, in a, an epileptic focus and decrease the seizures. So we, we did a mouse, mo we created, we developed a mouse model in which we can induce this chronic epilepsy. So these animals uh, can have spontaneous seizures as happens in patients. And then we impl implanted the wireless transmitters, putting transmitters to record their activity in the brain. And we can, and we recorded the, the seizures 24 or seven for, for two weeks. Then we inject the virus. And then uh, again, we record the other two weeks afterwards to understand if actually we can decrease the number of seizures in these animals. And uh, actually what we saw is a, a clear decrease of 80% of the number of seizures. These are the seizures before two, uh, two weeks before the virus in controls. This is in, uh, in uh, the one that then we receive the treatment uh, and this is after uh, and this is after the treatment. So we saw a decrease of 80 percent that is quite uh, a, a very good decrease, meaning that usually the drugs um, is considered that works if they decrease at least 50 percent the number of seizures. So here we have 80 percent so it's going even above the the normal threshold for a, an antipilotic drug. And then the last things that we want to test is, uh, okay, we are using the mouse model and uh, and works, and it's, it's quite a common model that the youth model test this. But we want us to test if we were able to, to, to show the same effect in a human cells, because at the end we wanted to treat patients, so we want something more clo close to the humans. Obviously, we cannot use directly humans, so we we decide uh, to to test it in vitro, and obviously it's not the same. It's not the real seizures as happen in in the brain, but at least the cells have, have are human cells. So basically, we created these mini brains formed by excitatory neurons inhibitory neurons, 
these together that are derived from fibroblasts from patients, in this case, an healthy patient. And uh, you can transform those fibroblasts from the skin uh, to pluripotent uh, stem cells that can be differentiated. Basically, you can create a human brains from that. And then we, we show that uh, you, they can create a, a mature human network, like having a really a mini brain in the dish. And then uh, what we show, just, just he, he, uh, look at the here, where is my pointer? We saw that in controls, you have this higher activity that is what we call epileptic, epileptic form activity in controls. And when we treat them with our therapy, you see less. So meaning that we can also show a decrease of a, a, a decrease of this increased hyperactivity, increased activity in human neurons, not only in, in rodents. So in this uh, in these works, we did also other things that uh, I didn't show you, but uh, anyway, is uh, I think that is the most important point here that we developed this therapy that is a bit a new way of thinking about a therapy in which you you can select the neurons that are pathological, so in this case that are hyperactive, and treat them in time and space independently of, of you don't need to decide, and the therapy will decide which one and when to treat it and stop the seizures. So we with Stephanie, we have also investment to to to, the, to trying to, to go to clinical trial with this approach. We have also uh, uh, investment to go to clinical trial with other uh, conventional approaches that obviously will be the first to, to, to be testing patients with, uh, with the focal epilepsies. This is still new, so will be done later on. And, uh, and recently we published this nice paper in, in Science and that was all the work of uh, HNQ, a brilliant PhD students in my lab. And uh, also, so if you want to read it, uh, and if you have any question, you can write to me. Or the, we also wrote uh, with Dimitri Kuhlman, we wrote a piece on uh, the conversation explaining uh, why it's important these uh, uh, new fundings. And uh, I, I was saying the last things that I want to say is that uh, it's not just epilepsy, because epilepsy is one of the many neurological diseases that are characterized by these intermi intermittent episodes, like a, a seizures, as I say, it's, it's not always a seizing a patient. So it's a, this intermittent episode where the brain change and you can use that change to create a therapy to stop that change. And uh, this can be used also for all uh, paroxysmal movement disorders uh, and, uh, and as well as, uh, for example, for psychosis that are intermittent episodes. And several of these, these pathologies also characterized by hyperactivity, as I say, increase of activity. So actually you can use exactly the same tool also for other pathologies. So this is the take home message to remember that in, a, in epileptic brain, but also in pathological brain, not all the neurons are doing the same things in the brain. So you need to consider also the difference of, of, uh, of the function of the different cells and trying to target in a precise way only the one that it needs to be treated because obviously not treating, uh, I didn't say before, but not treating treating all the cells, no matter what they are doing, it can cause also side effects that can be long-term problematic. So I want to thanks all the people in, uh, in my lab uh, that obviously did uh, help to do the, the, all this job and principally each and Q and Natalia O'Neill and Clara Zori that did a lot of this work and my collaborating group is Stephanie here and Dimitri and Matthew and that uh, we are working all together, us four, we are working all together in these therapies. One stand for all the help in vivo and the Manjo Kurian and Serena Barral at the ICH that they help in developing the human models that they show you and all the funders that uh, make that 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 this this story make it, make it finish the story basically help me to finish the story thank you very much thank you gabrielle uh that was fantastic thanks can you hear me Yep, and you finished bang on time. So well done. And um, I will apologize to all the people in Ealings whose houses have been burned down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't know. I had to choose one at the end, right? So. 
I, I'm sure that they'll have proper gene therapy. So we've got a couple of questions coming in and we've only got a few minutes. So I'm going to kick off with the first one. So um, first question is, why did you choose the canic acid epilepsy model? Canic acid is known to have quite an aggressive effect on the brain tissue. Why not kindling or status epilepticus models? Yeah, thank, thanks for the, the very technical questions. So it's, uh, it's someone working on the epilepsy field. Somebody knows their models, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, this is a model with the kinase, but it's a status epilepticus model. So you induce the status epilepticus and uh, you wait that they develop chronic epilepsies. Yeah, it's an aggressive model, but it resembles quite well also the, the patient's um, temporal lobe epilepsy. And... Uh, and I think that uh, we show that works in this model, uh, and we are quite confident it can work also from with milder models. Obviously, if it's very aggressive, is 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 even more uh, more uh, uh, will be very even stronger at the fact that we see in milder models. And the other, the kindling is not really a chronic epilepsy model; it's more on uh, of seizures model more than uh, than epilepsy. So. We decide to use this method because this this model because it represents better what what will happen will happen to patients with status epilepticus and then chronic epilepsy. And just to clarify, this was intramigdala canic acid, not systemic canic acid. Yes, intramigdala canic acid. Yes. So really, yeah, targeting a much smaller amount of canic acid and less damage, I think, than the um. The, this the... is the, yes, so it's, it's less damage in the hippocampus. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you. Um. I think the next question is, um, how will this approach be used in patients and what kinds of patients are the first ones that you think will come through the queue? Yeah, actually, you can answer even better than me, Stephanie, but uh, um, is there something that that also Stephanie Pioneer, Pioneer this, this uh, idea of this uh, mm -hmm. therapy. So the, the, the first idea is the idea is to to start with the patients that can have surgery. So patients with focal epilepsy that can undergo surgery, drug resistant, but that can have the surgery. And then offer these patients the, the gene therapy. And so they can decide if having military surgery or the gene therapy. And then uh, after gene therapy, if they decided for the gene therapy, they can decide later on if have surgery or not, or continues to stay like that. Maybe the, the gene therapy works perfectly, but we still have the option, the safety option, to remove that part of the brain as was previously decided for these patients. Obviously, our target will be also for patients that cannot have surgery, but this will be a second step. Nice. Great. Um, so next question. Um, the gene therapy aims to target only the epileptic neurons. To what extent were healthy neurons prevented from reducing their excitation in your mouse models? Yeah, it's very good uh, questions. It's very difficult to to assess that uh, as well because, as as I say before, the the, the epileptic brain, but the brain is very dynamic, so the activity change all the time. So we did some tests and we show basically that uh, if we target only those neurons that are hyperactive after seizures or after the increase of pathological activity in epilepsy, we are able to decrease the following seizures and the following pathological activity. So we think that we can target just the ones that are important for the seizures. So sparing completely the other ones. If some of these neurons are also healthy, will increase their activity for some reason, maybe they can be decrease their activity with the gene therapy, but uh, we didn't see any bad side effect on that. So I'm quite confident we are targeting the right ones. So that's, yeah, and that kind of, well, sort of blends into the next question, which is, can this approach uh, interfere with normal brain functions? Yeah, exactly. Is uh, is uh, the slides that I put there for the behavior in mice showing uh, that um, that we are not affecting basal behavior, but basic physiological behavior. Actually, I skipped uh, one one part because uh, I thought that it was too long to explain, and uh, so that the uh, limit uh, was close to the end of the talk. Basically, we did another experiment in which we induce the seizures and then test the behavior after, so after activating this virus. And actually, we see a bit of improvement of the behavior after. So meaning that also, if you mm -hmm. think of patients that have seizures, and uh, usually after a seizure, they have a memory 
impairment uh, for a bit of time after the seizures. In this case, with also this therapy, if happens the seizure, hopefully we prevent completely the seizure, but if happens, this can also help the memory afterwards. And while we're on memory, sorry, I'm pelting you with questions, but while we're on memory, um, as you know, patient HM uh, was alive. If he was alive today with his intractable seizure disorder, would it have been possible to treat his seizures with gene therapy without without such surgery? Yeah, because HM was uh, completely uh, hippocamp. Uh, all, all... He was hippocampal, yeah, yeah bilateral. Yeah. Bilateral hippocampus. So in that case, yeah, because it was very severe, because obviously the, the effect on that uh, with the bilateral hippocampal removal is the memory, obviously, affect everyone knows the, the case. And uh, in that case, we can, in, in theory, we can, in, the, in that particular case, we can inject the therapy in the two hippocampi and trying to prevent the surgery. Yeah, I mean, bilateral, it would be a concern, but, you know, better than what happened to HM, for sure. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And do you, do you, um, the hippocampus does express the CFOS promoter sometimes. What kinds of activities might it express if, if somebody did have this gene therapy in their hippocampus? Is is yeah, it was the test that uh, I show about the contextual fear conditioning uh, with the mm -hmm. fear condition of the mice that is activating the hippocampus and showing that we are not really changing any proper memory and formation in the hippocampus. So CFOS is naturally expressed, but seems that the, the that behavior that activates CFOS is not so strong as the seizures to have then have an impact of our therapy, our tool on the normal yeah. physiological function of the cells. It's also true that the expression of the potassium channel is, you know, if you do get a little bit of potassium channel overexpressed during normal CFOS activation, it doesn't have enormous effects on the brain cells. So it may be that when CFOS is activated in the fear conditioning, it's just not enough to block the fear conditioning. Exactly. Also, fear conditioning is not a seizure, I suppose. <laughs> no, exactly. It's very, very low number of cells activated and not very at high levels. So, yeah. so okay. Um, so can you tell me uh, just a little bit about, so we, oh, sorry, I asked that question about uh, patients and what category of patients. So, so is there any hope of this being used to pe treat people with genetic epilepsies? I hope so. And uh, it's something that we are testing at the moment. Mm -hmm. The idea of genetic epilepsy is, is that uh, obviously most of the time we don't know where the seizures start and most of the time is all brain and sometimes start from one region sometimes from another sometimes it's not clear from where so in theory if you transduce all the brain with the, all the key regions with this system you can prevent the seizures of genetic epilepsies it's something that we we haven't tested yet fully tested yet and do you have um you mentioned the possibility of other diseases. Have you done any tests for other diseases? Uh, not yet. We are doing now on tauopathies, so mm -hmm. more on dementia, because we know that there is an early onset hyperexcitability in dementia, even before the cognitive declines. So we are testing now PhD students in my lab is testing if this system can be used also to prevent a cognitive decline in dementia. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so how how far from actually treating patients is this? <laughs> Sorry about this. I know it's a loaded question, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a common one. Uh, this one, uh, in general, gene therapy for epilepsy should be soon, uh, and this Stephanie can confirm because the first clinical prior, trial will be Stephanie's clinical trial, <laughs> and uh, should be. If, started two years ago <laughs> but after covid there was uh, quite a lot uh, a lot of delays mm -hmm. and um and so soon i think in the next years one two years should start the first uh, gene therapy for epilepsy and then this one i think that be at least five years before because obviously there is a lot of um you need to tick a lot of boxes for the regulatory agency and do a lot of uh, preclinical testing, not just in mice, to be sure that uh, what you are doing in humans is safe. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So I'm expecting in the next five years, probably this particular one. But the gene therapy for epilepsy is real, is happening soon. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, so. Uh, so so you've designed this new treatment and you've obviously been using the tools that are available to you. Can you describe what you think the ideal gene therapy would be if you could, you know, design it without being limited to what's already out there? Can you just say what it would be for epilepsy? What would you change? What do you wish there was possible? <laughs> This is very tricky questions, and we have 10 minutes, so probably we can go on. <laughs> Take and your time. <laughs> so I think that uh, obviously this this, um, this, uh, this new way of doing gene therapy can be the basis of that. I think that uh, I will want a promoter that is really only specific for seizures, not for other BAs, as we discussed before. Mm -hmm. And that is very fast activated, so you, you can really prevent the seizures. And uh, and there is also the possibility to, if if we treat the seizures, we treat the pathology, and the brain is fine, to have a way to to take it out. Mm -hmm. And and hopefully the, the patients will be seizure free also without it if we can. You mean not take it out but turn it off. Yeah, yeah. Is ideally you say ideally you take it out. You can't obviously, but uh, switch it off. Yes, mm -hmm. I was very hypothetical, very sky uh, blue yeah, sky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the point of the question. Yeah. So, um, you're using AAV, and um, there's a lot of work on AAV. Would there? What do you think about the chances of sort of systemic AAV for epilepsy versus direct injection of AAV for epilepsy? Um, okay, for focal epilepsy, what, what I show you today is better to have direct inject in, the, in that region of the brain because you can target only in a region and you don't have any other off targets around the brain. For a genetic epilepsy, so you're right, I think that uh, having a systemic delivery in a way that uh, there are new vectors now, new AAVs that you can deliver through the, through the um bloodstream so to the to the vein and they can go directly to, to to the brain without affecting other organs and target and basically target all the brains that they think that will be a good option so i think that there are few companies now uh in the states that are trying to push quite hard to start a clinical trial with these viruses mm -hmm. but at the moment has never been tried in, in humans because yeah. there is always the problem of side effects of all, all, all other organs. And that have been tested that there are some variants of this AAV that can go directly on, only on the brain without affecting any other organs, but obviously has been done in non-human primates or in rodents, and you never know what will happen in humans, right? So yeah. it's, it's a bit tricky, the, 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 the safety side of that. But if it works, I think that will change completely the possibility of the, of the therapies because it's also very, it's not invasive because mm -hmm. it's just in the vein and uh, treat all the brain. So yeah. I think that will change completely the, the game if it's going to the clinic. So better viruses would be a big step forward or better delivery mechanisms would be a big step forward. Yeah. You mentioned CRISPR a little bit. Um, do you think CRISPR is going to replace your approach? Ah, good question. I think that CRISPR will replace all the approaches in which you try to treat the cause. Mm. So if you try to treat the cause, CRISPR, what it can do is correct the cause mm. instead of, of adding a new gene and, and treating it. Is more is a system that you can go there and correct directly the mutations and the codes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that when we 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 know better about side effects again and uh, safety, I think that, that would be the the, the next uh, the next step for 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 the gene therapy for epilepsy, for example. Mm -hmm. But again, as as I say in that slide, and I think that Stefan, you agree with me that that the epilepsy and genetic epilepsy are mostly neurodevelopmental in which means that uh, they does not just affect that that 
pro that that uh, products that they, they are expressing, but is they are affecting how the brain is formed and how they see this are formed. So if you want to correct the cause, you need to do very early. And very early means that you need a, a system in place that you can do a, a diagnosis very, very early that at the moment is not really feasible. Um, but actually, if you want, if, uh, and most of the time uh, the clinicians say, ah, these patients have epilepsy because they see the seizures, right? Because you don't know the cause. So at that point, probably it's too late to correct the cause. And that in that case, I think as as also I think also you agree, it's better to try to treat the symptoms at that stage. If we are we are aware of the what is causing the pathology early on before all these things happen, then treating the cause is better. But I think that we are, we are a bit far from that. Also, if there are some clinical trials ongoing on a genetic uh, epilepsy called Dravet syndrome mm -hmm. that is caused by the decrease of a, a gene, the sodium channel gene. And there are clinical trials going at the moment to try to, to re-put back that gene or re increase the activity of that gene and also in adult and adolescents. So quite la later, quite a long, a lot later than, than when, when the symptom starts, that is six months more or less in, this, in these patients. And uh, I'm very curious to know if it will work. I mean, targeting the cause so later on after the brain is completely formed, if it's enough to treat the pathology, that will be a quite good uh, way to, um, to know if, mm -hmm. if we can treat the cause also later on. So I'm curious to know. <laughs> it would be good. So I just, we, we only have a few minutes left and I just want to end with just a general question about your experience as a scientist. So you've, you've done extremely well. You've got all these great ideas. Do you have general advice for somebody who's thinking about getting into research, getting into gene therapy or neuroscience generally? What, what's your thoughts on that? What would you suggest to somebody who comes to you and says they want to be a researcher at UCL? Okay, yes. Um, I think that for doing what we are doing is you really need to really like what you are doing. It's, it's more, it's, it's also an hobby, it's not just a, a job, right? You need to be fully invested in what you are doing and, uh, and basically wake up in the morning and be happy to do what you are doing. This is the only way that you can survive doing a research because obviously it's as Stephanie knows, and she was actually my boss before, is is a lot of up and downs, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to have a lot of resilience and a lot of willingness to to to, to find, uh, to to discover things and be and uh, yes, have this this uh, this uh, how to say this uh, this um, you really you really want to do that and want to discover and want to to understand things and be happy to do it otherwise it's it's, it's, it's not worth it i think yeah. i don't know what you think about that you are the dean of the faculty so you can have <laughs> also your say about that so i suppose if you find research addictive you stay in research <laughs> exactly <laughs> Well, thank you so much. That was really a great talk. I really enjoyed Thanks. it. It's always fun to hear the story from a different perspective. Um, just for people who are listening, um, firstly, many thanks for coming and listening and thank you for the questions, uh, the really interesting questions. We're gonna close the event now, but I want just to let you all know that this was the final lunch hour lecture for, for this term. And we will be resuming the series. We're looking forward to resuming the series in the autumn with a new term. Uh, and for those of you who want to stay up to date with the lecture series, do sign up to the UCL Minds mailing list and you'll get a nice monthly email telling you what's coming and what new lectures are about to happen. So thank you very much, everyone. And I hope to see you all in the autumn. And thank you, Gabrielle. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie.